it is very appropriate that um, this session on the environment comes at the end of a two-day conference. Some design professionals might object to being placed at the end of the conference, but um, for me, or certainly for Esme, it's most appropriate. Because in the best of all possible worlds, um, if we are creating a new school or refurbishing a school, um, what we want is for the, the sort of principles that, and practice that we've been hearing about in the last two days um, to, be, to, be, to be in place, to be understood preferably by the whole school, to be clearly articulated. Um, and that then forms the design brief for the, <coughs> for the physical environment, not the other way around. And, and I know that um, from working in Syria for, for a long, long time, it, what you get often is the building and then you're told to make it work. So, it, we need to think about ideals, as Marilyn said to us this morning. And also, um, Marilyn said uh, at one point, how do we create the conditions? And that, that was the question for all of us. How do we create the conditions in which these ideas can flourish? Now that applies to the the, the social environment, the, the teaching environment, but equally to the physical environment. And it's often surprising to people, I guess even to me sometimes, that um, though the physical environment is made up of hard, tangible things, you know, things you can touch, um, it not only affects how we can function, what, what is possible, how we work, but also how we feel. So it's both the, the physical effect, but also the psychological effect. And again, um, going back to um, cultural historical theory and... Perry Sivani. Thank you. Perry Sivani, that one. Um, <laughs> which is about the relationship between uh, cognitive and, and, and emotions. It's, I see that very clearly uh, in... Well, I don't see it clearly. Um, it's something that we all have to work together to, to build, I believe. So, it, it, Shana and I will present this session together. And as we talked about um, planning for it, we thought it, it's not only important to present to you something about the design and development of the environments that you've seen around the school, but also um, the ongoing development and enrichment and assessment of those environments, which Shana is, is very intimately uh, involved with. So, when the, um, when the physical environment is well designed, and, and in design speak we call that a, a, a design, a tight fit design for purpose, I think today I've got at least one other design person here. Yes, Sandy, yeah, up the back. Um, we, we talk about that being a type fit and design for purpose. And when you achieve that, and it's not only in schools, but in homes, restaurants, wherever, um, then things work well, people know what's possible, how to do things. Um, but it also, I think in schools the important thing is that it gives cues for how things can be used. So in that sense, um, and some of you will be familiar with the term that Reggio used, the environment as a third teacher, um, I would say that the environment be can become a teacher in itself. It can help and support you. So that, for example, um, putting materials close to the point of use on open shelving is saying to the children, this is what's possible, it's here for you to use. Um, it, so in that way, it, it's, it's enriching your, your possibilities. Um, and it will be clear from um, all that you've experienced, all that you've heard, particularly from Esme and Marilyn, um, that relationships are at the heart of uh, Princess Hill practice. And this is, you can look at it in a number of ways, it's relationships um, between people which contribute to a sense of well-being, a sense of belonging, um, but it's also relationships as uh, the basis for the sort of rich learning that you have seen and, and heard about. 
uh, it's those relationships that, and the, the unique characteristics that each participant, child and adult, brings to those um, inquiries that create such uh, deep and um, interesting and ongoing, because these are projects, as you can see, that go on over a year, often, don't they? And um, as Loris Malaguzzi, the, the founding director of Original Media, said, that one of the most important things is to get the right question, the right focus, that will sustain children's interest over a long period of time. And I think that's what the teachers here are, are doing so wonderfully. And it gets better and better. I should just say, I'm, um, as a designer, I'm, I'm inspired by many sources. What you see is not, I don't think any of it is particularly new um, or innovative. I mean, I guess it depends, I guess, on your, it's all relative, isn't it? You know, it may be innovative compared with traditional schools. But, there is a very long, um, strong heritage of great school design linked to great uh, ecological <coughs> innovation. Not much of it. And innovators have quite a lot of influence on mainstream school. But nevertheless, the examples are there. Um, and they got what you can say, Pestalozzi, Froebel, <coughs> Montessori, um, Dewey, on and on. And often when you look at these cases, it, it's um, where the, the educational luminary hooked up with a great architect. Frank Lloyd Wright, um, Saruman, all sorts of you know, amazing relationships that developed progressive schools. We could spend a great deal of time examining why they have influenced mainstream, but I like to think that they actually are starting to now, or have been a little. A diversion. Um, oh, but I do want to say that, that if anybody's interested, then I really do say it, it's a very rich area to, to mine. There are fabulous things we've done in America in, um, in the UK in the 60s as a result of government policy. It really inspired teams of people to do amazing things in terms of um, planning of musical buildings and even furniture development, Six, systems of furniture development. So now on to Princess Hill. And I was very pleased when I thought of using the word building. Um, I wanted to stick with relationships and I want to talk about personal relationships and relationships in, in the learning um, environment. But a building it has both that sense of um, physicality but also of um, what, what you're all doing, the, the, the social, the role of the teacher. In the same way that the discussion about cultural and historical theory spreads the net very wide, it's talking about the development of um, children, people, uh, not only in an academic sense, but in a very full sense of their person, their personality. Um, but then linking that to the biggest picture of, of the development of the culture and the community. So then, it, as I listen particularly to Marilyn and Esme, and I love to love hearing the exchange between them, I think, okay, now how does that come right back to the physicality of a school? And one of the things that strikes me when I, every time I come here, and I do it constantly, um, is walking through the, the um, fence. The boundary between the school and the community here is absolutely minimal. There's a very strong visual contact between the school and the, the surrounding neighbourhood. So you, if you look at that slide, just above the boy's head, you probably can't see it, but there's a gate, and the gates are always open, and there are many of them. Um, but they're always slightly ajar, as if this is a good, you know, you're, you're welcome to come in. This belongs to you, and it does. Our taxes pay. This is our school, and it's demonstrating there's a real permeability between the culture of the school and the surrounding. 
I'm about to, um, for my sins, um, be involved in a masterclass of uh, architecture students, and the project they've been set is to design a school for Docklands. Because <laughs> last night I thought, oh my God, you know, how do you apply this to Docklands? Doesn't matter. If you've got the principle in mind that that is your goal, you'll find a way to do it. And that I think is something that's really important to say about design. Design can be done by anybody. <coughs> the essential thing is knowing what the intent is. If you can, if you can express <coughs> what it is you're trying to do, if you can describe the experience that you want the participants to have, and not because it doesn't only apply to school, it applies to homes, um, football stadiums, wherever. You, if you define the need, then you can solve the problem. This one's a bit of a problem. <laughs> the next, you've got through the gate, now you're coming in the front entry. Is the entry welcoming, inviting? Is it clear where it is? No. <laughs> is there good Wi-Fi? No. <laughs> so that's you may say, what's this going to do with design? These are all aspects of um, making this good work better. <clears throat> this building has to be said, was sort of dumped on board, this man. <laughs> First day she started the job, she was handed a sheet of working drawings off of that building, and I think we said yesterday, told that's that's it. Not much you can do, and you certainly can't change the structure. We did the best we could in a week, but um, part of their intent, part of their design brief, was to put a new, to build a new building in character with the existing buildings. Which, which culture do we? This is a contemporary culture. Why would you want to express something that was probably already bad in the early 1900s? So we just perpetuated it. No, but that was a chance to do something. Wonderful view. Uh, I can see my after colleague groaning. Um, so we've got through the entry. Now we want to continue this, as it were, handshake. You know, you're welcome in. And tell people something about the lives of the participants in this school. What, are the, what is it they're doing? What, are, what, are, what do they place a value on? What's important to them? And by the, the, the thoughtfulness, the quality of thinking that goes into um, the design of the presentation of that project, it pays respect to um, the incredible work that the teachers and, and children have put into the project. So, going back to what I was saying earlier, the physical environment is not only about how we function and how we, we feel. Um, the, you can also convey intangible qualities like uh, notions of, of trust and respect through the thoughtfulness of the way you organise the environment and present things. So we have a, a system of a modular system of display cases that are easy for teachers to um, lift off and change the contents through them. The coffee cup you would have seen yesterday, um, a piece of movable environment, um, comes and goes, comes once a week and after assembly and it, it, I think it, it forms a really lovely focus, doesn't it, between families and, and school. So this is about building relationships between children's in-school and out-of-school experiences. Again, something that as Mary Marlon have talked a lot about. Um, the children are learning, I've heard experts say it, so it must be right, much more out-of-school than they do in-school. So they've got this rich and wonderful life going on outside school. How do we relate it to what is happening inside school? And is the playground the, if you like, the transition between the two. Because when you look at what the children are doing in the playground, and there's some marvellous observations being made here, 
um, the children are doing what we say we want them to do. They're collaborating, they're very active, it's spontaneous, it's self-managed, it's incredibly creative and imaginative. How do we facilitate that without interfering with it? It's really challenging. Um, here we have a relationship between what's happening inside the classroom, strange old traditional classroom that the very imaginative teachers opened it up and allowed the contents to spill out into the playground. And a little detail there um, of what's happening on the ground, it, the kids have been building with, with blocks, they've been building a, a zoo and so they've got the reptile enclosure and they've got signs labelling the, the, the animals and I thought, aha, so I'm starting to think like a teacher and say, do this for long enough. Um, it's a bit of literacy in the playground, yeah. in a very nice natural way. Very big concept, very important to what's happening here. It's about developing a, a, a democratic community of learners or researchers. How do we bring the whole neighbourhood community of 70, hundred of children and their teams of teachers together regularly would be but once twice a day for just sharing, getting to know you, um, <coughs> presentations, but also um, what's my point? Um, getting together anyway. Building the democratic community, it seems to me it's really important that you have eye contact. And over the years, I've gone into hundreds of classrooms where I see a teacher sitting on a chair at the front and all the kids sitting on the floor facing them. And, and that may be all right for some situations, but if you're trying to encourage democratic relationships, there doesn't seem to be the way to do it. And, and anyway, it's always the little boys at the back who are mucking up because all they're doing is looking at the backs of kids and all the other kids. But if you're in eye contact, as long as we are here, um, then it, it's much more like the Agora, I suppose, the, the original Greek idea of establishing a, a democracy. How do we build a community of practice? Uh, many examples I could give, but um, this is the conference room um, where the teachers and visitors regularly meet. And so with documentation of projects on the wall there, Again, it's saying this school values um, the work of our communities of practice. So, moving a little bit from personal relationships, if you like, um, what is the basis, how do we design for this very complex and dynamic learning situation? For me as a designer, I don't know whether my colleague over there would, would also agree. When I look at the documentation of these very rich, long projects, um, and when I particularly try to tease it out, here's one of the process charts. Um, and you look at the stages that the process goes through, and you look at the experiences that the children and teachers have. Um, my goodness, you know, they're going to do this, they're going to be doing that, da, 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 da. and you can't anticipate when it's going to happen. It's got to be fluid. As Tomo was saying this morning, it's really, you're talking about technical equipment, but I see that in terms of space. You need to be able to move when you need it from a small group discussion to somewhere to do a drawing, somewhere to go and make an animation, uh, somewhere to role play. It, those spaces not need to be always available and you have a great variety of concurrent activities going on at the same time. So this in a way is like a design group. It's incredibly useful to me um, as a way of knowing what your needs are. And I think as I showed these diagrams yesterday that we've got, um, you know, we're reconceptualising the groupings of people, we're no longer talking about class groups of 20, 25 with one teacher. We're talking about kids working alone, in pairs, in small groups, larger groups, whole groups. Um, 
and then maybe coming together to discuss them and looking at presentations. So the other chart is, is the current state, in my mind, of the vocabulary of settings that we're trying to, to develop. So we'll go through that. Oh, just a word about um, spatial typologies. Over the history of school development, um, the, the chart on the right, left you will all be very familiar with, um, replicated all over the world forever, single classrooms linked by long corridors. And then in the glorious 70s, we ripped out all the um, internal walls and we had large, open, unusable spaces. <laughs> um, at other periods, we've had central shared spaces with classrooms around, which is what we were going to have in the years three, four. I think, um, and there's wonderful work being done by Dutch architect Herman Hertzberger, uh, who talks about um, heterogeneous spaces. So these are spaces that are made, it's a, it's, a, it's a one space, it's a shared communal space, but it's actually made up of many uh, spaces within settings, uh, all the way from intimate spaces to more open, but they're all intimate, they're all fluidly linked together. They may have um, enclosures or walls for the sake of, of acoustic control, but that may be glazed. And we've got some interesting examples now, a couple of high schools I've worked on, where that's been very important. And, but by having a glazed wall, and particularly large glazed walls, which we can do now, and you can slide it aside, uh, you still keep that sense of connection and fluidity. And I think, going back to the earlier thing about how you create democratic communities, I think it's important that um, when you're in that space, and I don't know what the teachers would say about this, but wherever you are, you want to have a sense of being connected to the whole community. Yeah? So you might be working in the multimedia room, but you also have a sense of, oh, from the other side, they're doing a dance. Or, you know. So it, it's keeping that sense of community, but still allowing you to do, this, this, the space is supporting what you need to do in your, at that point. So this is more of the same. This is the glazed connections between spaces. So you're seeing right through <coughs> the whole space. Um, and again, as I showed this yesterday, this is the year three, four, and how we map those settings onto the space that we had to deal with. Now just trying this in for the our Campbell High colleagues. Um, it's simply to say that the same principles uh, I applied to the spatial planning of this high school building, it's just opened this year, it's got exactly the same vocabulary of settings in it uh, and the same connectivity, uh, but it's for uh, high school students. How do we build close personal relationships? Obviously, that's at the heart of it. Um, and do that in many ways, but I think it's by providing more intimate and informal settings where people can be close together <laughs> and chat and get to know one another. Feel comfortable. Also used for reading and as you can see for music making. Co-creating the curriculum. Um, the spaces that are designed for the whole neighbourhood to come together, also work for another number of other purposes. So obviously in all of this, we've never got enough space, we've never got enough money. So part of the thing that design should be good at is rationalising. You know, so you've got all these things you want to do, but some of them can be done in the same space. So how can we, and, and something like a whole group meeting um, only takes place for a short time, maybe once or twice a day, that space is, can then be used for other things. Um, so in this case, you can see the screen down, it can be used for film presentations, um, whole group meetings. If 
if you know that's the intent of the beginning, then you can design the, the uh, space to be. Again, co-creating the curriculum, absolutely vital to this way of working is the ongoing documentation of the work in progress so that everybody can see and I'll use the word reflect <laughs> no, but on um, the developing understanding of the group. And then you can look at what's our next move. You can use it for the basis for planning the next, next moves. What, what have we done and where are we going? Which means walls, means lots and lots of walls, which often we don't have. Um, then you have to use other devices to, to put that material in the room. And that's changed. So it comes off the wall, goes into folders to be reviewed at the end of the project. Right, I think I've gone off the rails here. Um, this is again the same that the, the same space that's designed for the whole group meeting can be used for all sorts of things. See, and the kids will always discover ways of using spaces that designers and teachers haven't thought about. Um, you can see the police there presenting uh, information about the police dogs as part of a year three, four inquiry. And Anna Maria doing you know, Italian. Get sick. And here's Anna Maria again, <laughs> dancing and singing, um, as we saw her the other day. So that's within that torus shape. Again, it, it works well for um, music and movement. Uh, small group discussion, where you want to have people comfortable, a bit informal, but with our good eye contact <clears throat> as a part of ongoing inquiries. Uh, again, Isma and I are awfully good at using uh, Target catalogues and Kia catalogues. <laughs> These are what, $150 a check. Which one's special? Mm. Well, $70 or something. Mm. $70? Yeah, if you were a fan. $70. Oh. <laughs> $70 for a beautifully designed, very comfortable, incredibly durable chair. <laughs> and they're light enough, the kids can move them around, and I think the kids feel a bit sort of special, aren't they? And they God, it took us a long time to decide on that. <laughs> <laughs> another story. Um, here is a different setting where, where it's more focused. So you've got a teacher with a small group of children in a target or focused learning situation. So in that case, um, we're using the physical elements of enclosure to, to, to contain the experience and to try and eliminate the um, nearby distractions. You would have seen these in the 5-6 neighbourhood. Um, again, rather special way of bringing a small group together. These are standard um, off-the-shelf items. And there's been a huge proliferation, I guess, since VR. Um, that's one of the good things about VR, was that, that it, it stimulated a whole lot of interest in people, um, um, a lot of people seeing ways of making money out of the schools. But there's some good things that happen. Uh, so here we've got like the central part of the neighbourhood, which um, is just a few tables, but so that, that can be used in, in a variety of ways for table-based activities or um, computer-based. But in, as part of that, there is a, a section that is, is raised, carpeted um, for construction. And I found from experience it's quite a good technique for, and particularly if it's surrounded with open shelves holding all the equipment. Um, again, the kids know what's possible, what they can do there, and this is the place to do it. But it also discourages um, all the little bits from wandering. Um, and it might also prevent the odd kid running through and knocking over constructions. Many of these techniques are just very well known in early childhood. But, and in early childhood, teachers just expect to use lots of stuff and they're used to presenting it well. It's not something that is part of the cultural primary and secondary schools yet. 
again, that's that construction. Okay. And it gives the kids a sense of enclosure within that much larger space. As part of their inquiry, then they want to go and draw, paint, build models, <coughs> do science experiments, and prepare food. So in the uh, wet areas, the, in the three, four neighbourhood, there are two sinks. So one is used for, for art and craft, the other is used for food preparation. And you've seen a lot of the use of um, ICT, multimedia production, and we want to support that whole process through from story writing, or script writing, storyboarding, um, filming, model making, editing, animating, and presenting. It's very engaging, and I, I was interested in your comment on it, that filmmaking is a very collaborative activity. I hadn't thought of that before. Look, I, I always realised how engaging it was to kids because it's very creative and responsive, but it is always very collaborative. And I remember one of the first interactive exhibitions I did nearly 30 years ago um, about the body, and I wanted to um, give people an experience of the food, the energy content of food relative to energy output in exercise. And one of the exhibits was um, a very, very ancient, well, at that point it was cutting edge technology, Apple IIe, green screen, and two of them in this exhibition space. And I kept fretting, thinking, this is not going to work because you, know, you get all these pressure people and that somebody will sit there and just dominate. Never like that. There was always a large group around it, interacting with it and talking. So we get, you know, found two different families <laughs> together, discussing and experimenting together. So, um, yeah, highly collaborative. It may be helpful to think of the physical environment being made up of layers, and and they are different degrees of permanence, and they're often the responsibilities of different agents, which makes it complicated. If you're involved in building a whole new school, um, then you really need to get the conversation going across all the people involved. So you've got the building, which is obviously the shell of the building, that's permanent. Um, and then into that, you, you place the things that start to divide up the space into smaller um, areas and settings. Uh, it's the second layer, and then the third layer is the um, is the transitory layer. It, it's changeable, and it's the layer that you are responsible for as teachers. It's the stuff that you build in, uh, that you bring in, children bring in, that talk about um, you as a community, what you value, what the work that you're doing, the inspirations. And have beautiful things in there that inspire people. Um, and, and it's it's the transitory way. But it's, it's the way that all of those come together that um, creates the the ambience and the emotional connection. I think that you know that our work as design professionals is perhaps in those first two layers, the building shell the built-in fittings, if you like. So that it's that next layer that creates the emotional bond, helps to develop a sense of identity, and hopefully makes kids feel, this is a good place to be, this is where I want to be. And then, if you're really lucky, a rainbow comes along, just happens to strike the edge of one of the windows and gives you a lovely spectrum on the wall. Um, and that's magic. And I, I started with a quote from Mary Jo Amelia about the pleasure of learning together, and I finished this one with nothing without joy. I think if we can hold that in our heads against all the challenges, um, we'll do good things for kids. So that's a bit about the thinking behind designing and developing the environments. That kicks it up, but then it starts to operate.